Hey guys, welcome to Consistent Preterism. In the words of Jesus in the first century, I'll be right back. Good morning, everyone. Happy morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. Hey, good morning, everyone. Happy morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. Look, you'll be glad. You will be absolutely amazed how much evidence there is to show, to prove definitively. So you see, it's not just preterists who recognize that this language is metaphoric. It's not just preterists who see that the Old Testament used this language in hyperbolic, metaphoric manner. No, no. The imagery here, his lightnings light up the world. Well, ask yourself the question, folks. Does lightning, you know, if I'm standing on my front porch here at Dollars Post paid to your door, it is impossible to do to be honest with hermeneutic and to take Matthew 24, 29 and following outside of the first century. I hope you enjoyed that summary and uh, realize how really how easy it is to prove. We'll see you on the flip side. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to my show. My name is Jason DaCosta. This is Consistent Preterism, and thank you for joining me today. Today is an interesting offering that I have for you. And the title of the offering is A Challenge to Dr. Don K. Preston. Now, if you don't know Dr. Don K. Preston... Dr. Don K. Preston is the leader of inconsistent preterism. Dr. Don was uh, influential uh, in my um, transition from partial preterism to full preterism, which lasted all of maybe three weeks before I realized partial preterism was wackadoodle, okay, and was not being consistent. But just like everything else in life, there's levels to this stuff, all right? There's levels. And when you see the levels and where they actually lead to, It's kind of shocking, right? But like any good, honest human, you go where the evidence leads. You don't deny and lie and be dishonest over the implications or because of implications. You go where the evidence leads, okay? And so I came into full preterism. I uh, began teaching the uh, core truths of inconsistent full preterism, such as, yes, the coming already occurred, the resurrection occurred, the judgment occurred, the saints already inherited the kingdom. Yes, all that occurred, but we are still playing today, okay? And of course, I did scriptural gymnastics and I uh, had to explain how him coming in the clouds in like manner would be different and how it just, you know, didn't necessarily mean that he would leave in the cloud or that he would come as the same way that he left in the clouds. And you know, the typical arguments, right? Um, But what ended up happening is I came and I approached, uh, well, no, I'm sorry. I wrote articles and I shared a lot of things on Facebook and um, Don and his wife were big fans of mine. Um, And they even admitted this in the book, those of you who have the Kingdom of Christ, the first book that I wrote when I was an inconsistent full prep, um, you know that Don's foreword was very, very flattering. Um, I mean, this guy was said a lot of great things about me, about the clarity um, with which I teach, um, how I use just extreme logic, concise arguments, cut right to the point. Um, And he really just told people that it was a blessing to read my work. Uh, and that him and his wife had enjoyed it and they 
read my work almost every morning. I, I'm pretty sure that's what it said. I could be paraphrasing it a little bit, but that's the gist of it. So the book was Don K. Preston published my book, um, did pretty well on my end, did well on his end, I guess. And um, then I sort of started to see problems. Okay, I saw problems with preterism. I saw problems with what the Bible actually says about who was under the curse. I saw problems with this claim that all humanity is under the law. I saw problems with the the uh, assumption that humanity has the law written on their hearts. I saw that the Bible actually said it was only Israel who had the law written on their hearts. So I said, you know what? Something's not right here. Then when I started to look a little deeper and started to see all of these clear, explicit statements in the New Testament and tie them back to things and promises that we have in the Old Testament, for instance, Deuteronomy chapter 4, around verse 27, where Moses is looking at the children of Israel and he tells them that in the latter days, Israelites, you, your descendants, will be scattered in the nations, paganized, right? Paganized, folks. These are Israelites in the nations, paganized. And Moses tells them they'd be not circumcised, but they'd be paganized and worshiping the work of men's hands, wood and stone, gods, idols, right? But Moses t promises them that God at that time would turn and have mercy upon them and he would remember the covenant that he made with their fathers. Now, who were their fathers? It was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Yeah, well, when we get to the New Testament, if we just had the capacity to remember the promises that we find in the Old, and mind you, Deuteronomy 4 is one of many. I mean, I could cite hundreds, hundreds of them throughout the Old Testament, all the way through the prophets. They're all there. All these promises of restoration, of calling Israel back from the nations, of calling Israel back from their paganized idol worshiping, false god worshiping positions in the farthest corners of the earth. And mind you, Jesus says, go to the ends of the earth and seek my elect when he comes on the scene. But isn't it amazing that if we only kept those things in mind when we came to Paul and his letters in the last days, okay, we could see Paul refer back to this promise of Moses. For instance, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. If you are Christ's. In other words, if you've received the mark of the Holy Spirit, because remember, the Holy Spirit was the sign, okay, that they were the elect, they were the chosen. Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 to 7, say explicitly who was getting the sealing of the Holy Spirit. It was the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? But Paul tells him, he says, if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and an heir according to the promise. Well, Folks, that is what Moses said in the beginning. He said, you're going to be out in the nations worshiping false idols, worshiping wood and stone, but God is going to turn and have mercy upon you and He will because he will remember the covenant that he made, the covenant promise that he made with your fathers. Well, here's Paul telling the Galatians that if you're Christ, it's because you're Abraham's seed and you're an heir according to the promise. In other words, you're receiving the mercy that Moses predicted you would receive in the beginning of the story. But Don doesn't allow the story to come full circle. Don doesn't allow the trajectory of the story to take its natural course. Okay, Don, of course, sees all the endings, but he jumps in and plays in a pond that he just doesn't belong. Okay, And he's making things up that are unbiblical. Like Paul, for instance, in Corinthians saying, however you were led, right? However you were led to these idols, these false wooden stone idols, right? Well, <laughs> what is Paul saying to the Corinthians? He's referring back again to the promise that Moses made. Here they are, they're out in Corinth, they're worshiping false idols, the wooden stone, the work of men's hands. And he's saying, however you were led, okay? Then we have places like, Romans, what did our father Abraham find according to the flesh or according to his circumcision? That's their father. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, all our fathers passed through the Red Sea and were baptized into Moses. I mean, I could go on and on and on for days, okay? But the point is, is that I started to see all these things and a clear view started to come through all the fog and all the nonsense. And that clear view was I.O., okay? Israel only, 
salvation was only for Israel, just like Jesus said, he only came for them. He only died for those under the law. He only died for sins committed under the first covenant. And at the end of the story, when the scroll rolls up, when the curtain comes down, all we see, folks, is the 12 tribes of Israel standing in heaven. And only they are the ones that could sing the redemption song because only they were the ones redeemed from the earth. Now, Donnie doesn't want anything to do with I.L., okay? But this video is going to put him on the spot. And we will see just how brave or cowardly Donnie is. Let me read you an email that I got from someone. And it's a copy and paste of one of Don K. Preston's latest announcements. And I'm going to read this and then we're going to make some statements on it. And then we're going to offer up a little challenge to Donnie K. Preston. This is what Don said, quote, just recently, Barry Isaacs approached me about being an admin on his site. I agreed, but I warned him that if I was to be an admin, some changes would be made. Chief among them being that the IO posters would promptly disappear. He agreed, stating that he made a horrible mistake, allowing them in the first place and even making a few of them moderators. Well, that comes to an end shortly. This is a Christian issue discussion forum. The IO camp is not Christian by any stretch of the imagination. IO denies the existence of the transcendent universal God that loves all mankind. That's bullshit. IO denies that Christ came first to Israel, but for the benefit of the nations. That's made up and not true. IO denies that God's love for all men and IO denies God's love for all men and says no man today can be saved, should be saved since there is no sin today. IO is practical atheism. As the proverb writer said, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The proper rendering is the fool has said in his heart, no God. It is not only a denial of the existence of God so much as, as it is the denial of God's meaning for us, for all mankind. That is IO in a nutshell. I am well aware of the hue and cry that the IO folks will offer. Preston is a coward. He knows IO cannot be, undefe cannot be defeated, so the only way he can respond is to ban us. This is unfair. I have heard it all before. IO has been answered every way possible. <laughs> Joe Simpson with whom I have my own differences, has been effectively exposing the fallacies of I.O. Joe Simpson, folks, are you kidding me? You can go to my own website. And then he plugs his site. He says, and check out the articles that I wrote last year if you want to read on the issue. Then he goes on, he says, for those who want to claim that we should not be afraid to discuss such issues, there are forums for debates and with atheist skeptics and other God haters. Interesting. So with this said, beginning today, literally momentarily, IO posters will be banned. Now, should Barry Isaacs change his mind and decide that this is not the proper action, he can tell me. But as of yesterday, after many private messages, this is where we are at and I am acting with his blessings. End quote. So that's Don K. Preston's message. And you can see that it is peppered with fear. Okay. And the fear is because he knows that Io would take an absolute whooping to his inconsistent preterism. And that's all I have done, okay? It's funny how Don is sort of a bully when it comes to exposing all these erroneous theologies out there, such as futurism, dispensationalism, amillennialism, and such. But when it comes to Io, I have made dozens of Don videos, some humorously bashing him, others ripping his arguments to shreds, scholarly like okay and don has never responded right folks think about that the big bad don k preston the debater himself the man who will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anyone he's challenged john MacArthur. he's challenged james white he's challenged all of these big time names in christianity and yet he won't respond to my videos on io and I'll tell you why he won't respond, because Don remembers just a couple of years ago when I went over to his page and I commented and I explained to him and his audience that they had no answers. I wrote a good, I don't know, six or seven long comment posts. I kept continuing in it, continuing it, part one, part two, part three, part four, part five, and part six. And after I wrote those posts, I checked my YouTube and I had gained 40 to 50 subscribers in the blink of an eye. And the reason why was because those particular remnant of people, many of whom are still daily listeners, how you doing out there, guys? 
they understood that what I was saying made way more sense than what Don claims. You see, Don claims that it all ended, but it all still continues. Don claims that the final judgment came, but uh, somehow people are still saved today. Saved from what? What final judgment, Don? Don claims that the final resurrection came, yet we are raised today, although Paul said all those who are Christ would be raised at his coming. So how is Don Christ's? Don claims that death in Hades was defeated, according to Revelation chapter 20 in the end, yet somehow people need salvation from death. If you ask Don today what people need saving from, it is death. Yet death and Hades contextually were defeated at the coming of the Lord. Don acts as if the coming of the Lord was just a simple light switch change for the elect, when in fact it was actually a similar catching and calling up into the clouds, just like the firstborn of the brethren, Jesus. When you ask Don if Jesus ascended into the clouds up to heaven, he says yes. He says yes. Right? That's his position. But then he denies that the rest of the brethren would follow suit. Okay? Christ was a prototype. The rest of them followed suit. This is what the story says. All right? He would, they would be changed at his coming, caught up together with the dead ones in the air. Okay? Not magically, not spiritually, like Donnie says, not a little light switch change where they just uh, became aware that they would be immortal, but yet they would still die later. I mean, it makes no sense. It's stupid, right? And shame on me for actually believing it for a short time until I came to my senses and said, what in the world are we teaching? Consistency and logic win out every time. And that's why Don won't square up against I.O., now, you might be saying, well, why don't you two just have a debate? Well, first of all, Donnie wouldn't do that. I know he wouldn't do that. Secondly, I don't do debates. Okay, I've told you guys this a hundred times. Debates for me are stupid. Nobody ever changes their mind in a debate. And personally, I don't want to exploit myself in that manner as the face of IO. All right. People are crazy. People hate IO. People say a lot of bad things about me and about the proponents of IO. I've been slandered and bashed more than you can imagine because of my uh, honoring of the truth and logic and consistency. So I don't want to be that guy who steps into a building to debate this guy as like some evil, you know, piece of you know what. Okay. But what I will do, and here's my challenge to Don K. Preston I am challenging Don K. Preston to put together a short, Don, short, okay? Not 200 parts, not 700 parts, not 10,000 parts on YouTube, but a short series opposing the IO viewpoint. Now, you can take as long as you want to do it, Donnie. You can do it now. You can wait a little while. Look, nobody cares about you disproving futurism anymore, okay? You can only teach Matthew 24 so many times. You can only refute bozos like Lance Connolly so many times. Nobody cares. These guys aren't a threat. Step up to the plate and start refuting something that is a threat, okay? And my challenge to Don is to make a short series of anti-IO videos full of his best arguments, whatever he can pull out, whatever he can come up with, Take it back to Adam. Take it back to Abraham. Refer to all the times God judged nations in the Old Testament. And let's dance. Okay, let's dance. I'm proposing no more than 10 videos at a maximum length of maybe 30 minutes a piece. All right? 30 minutes a piece. Now, obviously... It gets a little tricky when you're responding and you have to keep it within a certain, you know, time frame. But I think that we can make this work. Don can begin the series. Don can come out with a 30-minute presentation opposing the IO viewpoint. I will come back and I will respond to that video. Okay? And we can go back and forth. Or... If Don feels more comfortable not going back and forth, he can produce his 10 anti-IO videos, share them as much as whenever he would like, and then I will come back and I will reply to all 10 of his anti-IO videos. All 10 of them. Okay? IO is not afraid of anybody. <laughs> because IO is the best 
most texturally honest, consistent, logical view there is. There has never been a view as crystal clear as IO. And IO has all the proof. It's got all the textual proof. It goes all the way back to Adam. It brings it all the way forward to the end of the story when the curse went away. Although somehow Don still got a curse going on today. It has it all. All right. So that's my challenge. I'm challenging Don K. Preston to a YouTube exchange slash debate. You produce 10 videos up to 30 minutes apiece. I will respond with 10 videos up to 30 minutes a piece and I will explain why your arguments are totally erroneous, inconsistent, illogical, and just cannot be. Now folks, let me ask you, do you think Don will step up to the plate? (laughs) Absolutely not. Okay, Donnie would never accept my challenge. If he does, I'll be shocked because guess what's going to happen? And this is what Don does not want to happen, okay? Don has about 5,000 subscribers on YouTube. And the last time this happened, I had just started to share my findings on IO. We're talking two years ago. And, you know, the chances of his subscribers seeing those comments, I believe they removed them too, after Don realized that they were getting a lot of hits and people were asking what's up and they had no answers. Actually, it was kind of interesting because I got no answers from Don. The first guy that actually replied to those comments was William Bell, who's like missing, like he's been raptured to heaven or something lately. But um, William Bell was the first one who came back with just a smoke screen response, which was just boring as all you know what. Didn't answer anything, didn't address my questions. I think I asked him very plainly, I said, explain to us when this promise to Moses was fulfilled, that Israelites would be paganized, idol worshiping, and God would have mercy upon them. The same mercy that Paul says in Romans 9, when he asks, is God having mercy upon the Gentiles? And then he quotes three passages all about lost, scattered, dispersed Israelites. And of course, they had no answer. Big Billy Billy Bell tried to bury that question under a heap of irrelevant nonsense. And so he came back, I think uh, Daniel, uh, what's his name? God, I don't even remember his name anymore. Little Woody, Toy Story Woody Woody looking fella. Uh, Daniel, 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 gosh, I don't remember. You know who I'm talking about. He's one of Donnie's boys. Um, He came back, tried to answer, got, got slapped down, never responded again. The only one who really answered was Big Billy Bell. Don chimed in every now and again, like, God always judged nations that sinned, right? And I explained to him that, no, I can give you all the proof you need that this was only the nations who messed around with the apple of his eye. This is the promise to Abraham that he would curse those who curse his seed, right? But of course, you know, what ended up eventually happening is I got banned from the channel and my comments were removed. And and after that, all the other IO people got banned from the channel as well. So you cannot find any IO comments or any IO links or anything on Don's videos because he just flat out won't allow it. Doesn't allow it. And the reason he doesn't allow it, especially now, is because he's got 5,000 subs. All right, probably close to 1,000 more than he did when I commented in the beginning. And Don knows very well that if he exposes or brings light and attention to my view and what I teach, people are going to cross over. Okay, people are going to, the, the honest ones, the ones who are actually truly Berean, right? It's funny. Somebody said, it's funny. IOers are actually the true Bereans, regardless of if salvation wasn't for us or not. They're actually more Berean than anybody else because we're the most honest. All right. And we, we actually do search the scriptures to see if these things are so. And emphatically, the scriptures say, hell no. Right. But Donnie would never allow that because he knows that. I would probably take a nice portion of his subs, or at the very least, they would start listening to my arguments. And of course, some of them won't like me, won't like my character, they'll be repulsed, you know, by the way that I talk and whatnot, but that's fine. That This is, I have no issue with that, okay? I don't really do this to please anybody. I do this because first of all, I wanna help the people who are honest. Secondly, it helps to release all this stuff from my brain because I too have a family that is very confused. So trying to talk about this stuff with people is like close to me is pretty, uh, pretty tough. They don't even want to get into into conversation because they know it won't go well, but Donnie won't 
uh, won't allow this. If he does, I'll be shocked and it'll be another win for IO. It'll be great because IO will move forward, but I highly doubt that he will do this. And just to uh, address Donnie's claims that IO is practical atheism, godless doctrine, God hating doctrine, God haters, atheists, you know, the, the typical uh, titles that he gives us. You know, this is kind of interesting to me because, first of all, IOers, for the most part, are not atheists, right? Probably many are agnostic. They admit that there could be a God, although there is clearly uh, not a lot of um, revealing done by that God, right? And, and look, I know, if you're a Christian, I get it. I've been around Christianity all my life. Everything is a sign from God. I get it, all right? Joe Dirt Simpson commented the other day, and uh, this is kind of what began this thing because I didn't really realize that, I didn't realize what Joe was talking about when he commented. Um, and whenever Joe comments, it's always kind of funny. But um, I didn't realize what he was actually talking about because he said something along the lines of, IO has been banned from Barry's group. God is at work, LOL. So like, he's all pumped up, right? The Holy Spirit's flowing, he's got those goosebumps. And the reason why was because God was at work because uh, IO was banned from one of the full preterist groups, all right? Now, first of all, I told Joe, I, I commented back, I said, <clears throat> hey, hey, Joe, that's kind of interesting. I said 8,500 children died of starvation yesterday alone and God kicked out IL from a Facebook debate group and he's at work. Oh, glory to God, right? I mean, this is the delusion. <clears throat> but secondly, like, if something as clear and as honest as IO is getting kicked out of a Bible discussion group, then you know there's a reason for it, all right? That stuff just doesn't happen, all right? But, you know, I get it. I understand Christians look at everything as a as an act of God, as a sign of God. They'll ignore the 50 people that were just massacred, you know, out out west. And I'm just using that as an example. Obviously, unfortunately, we know this happens a lot. But they ignore these massacres, right? These bloodbaths all over the world, many of which include many supposed Christ followers, right? Tons of them. Okay? And they ignore all that, but yet <clears throat> if their sore toe goes away, it's a wonderful, miraculous, marvelous act of God, and it's because you follow Christ, all right? So del delusion is just a perfect word for it, right? I would prefer um, reality and honesty <laughs> over delusion any day, okay? But, uh, you know, Donnie tends to call us atheists and all this stuff and all these this God-hating doctrine, whatever, godless doctrine. But the reason why Don is doing this, and it's very, very clever, and again, I've always said Don is very clever, which is why I'm really hoping that he accepts this challenge so that I can just absolutely d destroy and humiliate his arguments and show just how ridiculously dishonest he is. Because what Don does this for, and the reason why Don calls us these things and labels us as such, is because it gives him an out, right? It gives him an out. And what do I mean by that? Well, it allows him to avoid debate and discussion with the Israel-only proponents. Because if he can claim that they're godless or they're um, cocky or they're uh, foul or they, they're, you know, wicked or they're atheists or godless, whatever title he can give us to make the Christian follow his Christian followers think that we are of the devil, I guess, sort of gets him off, you know, off the hot seat, if you will. They say, well, you know, that's why Don doesn't debate because these guys are godless. <laughs> these guys are godless is the reason why Don won't debate. And the reason why Don won't step up and engage. But I'm calling it right now that Don is using it as a cop-out. So that he doesn't have to lock horns with the obvious problems. And boy, are there a lot of them for his theology. See, when you're a futurist, you can sort of just play dumb to the time statements. You can ignore them and, 
you know, and, and look for Jesus to come down in a helicopter taking bullets off the chest like Rambo, right? That's what futurism does. It's, it really doesn't require a lot of thought, you know? You just open the Bible, flick to a page, point, and that's you. That's, that's all about you, right? But when you're a full preterist and you subscribe to a doctrine that is similar to Don K. Preston's, well, you do... You do the Bible a little bit more intelligently. You look at things. You ask the questions. Who, what, when, where, why. All right? So for a full preterist who says that salvation, judgment, resurrection, the gospel, all these things continue beyond the end. <laughs> it's just absolutely ludicrous. And I will surely demonstrate that. And I have demonstrated that over the last couple of years here on my channel. And I will continue to demonstrate that. And I will continue to challenge these big dogs like Don. Now, I don't want the little dogs like Matty Simon, right? Matty Simon was a little dog. Matty Simon's a little puppy. He's not, he's a puppy chihuahua in terms of theology. His theology, the futurism nonsense that, he, that he's putting forth now is totally, totally silly. All right. It's like a joke. But it's really all I all I had in terms of someone who was stepping up and making videos against IO. So I had to do it. All right. So, but that was just an activity. That was just kind of fun. But when I saw that Don put out this post and called IOers what he called them and said that they're not allowed here and everything, it kind of upset me a little bit because IOers really study their Bibles. All right, and now I know you you uh, wannabes out there are kind of mocking and sh shaking your head and saying, how stupid is that? It's not even about them and they study it. You know, it makes no sense. Why study it if it's not about you? Uh, why does anyone study any historical book if it's not about them? Why does anyone take part in any kind of professional, you know, studies if it's not about them? Because it interests them, okay, bonehead? It interests them. And honestly, coming from the background that I did and seeing how twisted this book has been used and how it's used to sort of um, manipulate and instill fear and all sorts of nonsense and, and burden people and, and, and cause people to basically waste valuable time in their life doing things that really are not relevant. I've seen all that. So it's important to me to continue to dig and dig and dig until there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever that this story is only about Israel. Now, obviously, I'm fully convinced, 180 million percent, but there's others out there who are not fully convinced, and those are the ones that I like to try to help because it's very clear to me, and I want it to be clear to them as well. Not because I'm trying to get them into hell with me or because I uh, want them to be judged at the final judgment. That's nonsense. Or not because I enjoy my sin, right? I cannot stand when somebody says that, you know? Like, I haven't gone out to a club in years, okay? I, I just, it's just not even, it's not even attractive to me anymore. I don't do those things that I once did when I was a young boy. And I haven't been a Christ follower for about three years now, almost. So, look bottom line is you can call me a sinner you can say that I enjoy my sin you can say that I enjoy my wickedness but you don't know who I am as a person you don't know what I do as a person you don't know how much time I spend giving to others as a person you don't know anything that I do so for you to say that I teach the things that I teach because I enjoy my sin is stupid right it's so stupid right but that's what a lot of people say so my point here is that Don is using these titles as a cop-out so that he doesn't have to lock horns and go to battle with the monster, with the beast, with the undefeated champion of the world, Israel only. And I, uh, let's see, there was, uh, somebody had sent me a couple screenshots from a group. Now there was a guy in one of these groups, right? And I'm not going to mention his name, but... He's anti-IO. He hates IO. Now, let me tell you how I evaluate commenters on my YouTube channel, okay, in case you're interested. When it comes to commenters, and boy, do I get a lot of random ones. Thankfully, YouTube is now um, now notifying me again of comments. For a time, time, and half a time, it wasn't. Like, I, I would get zero notifications on new comments. On my whole channel, I got like 350 videos. I don't know how many hours worth of content. 
and I would never get notifications. Every once in a blue moon, I'd go back and like, or you know how YouTube gives you like random um, memories of videos that you've produced. And I'd look at them and I'd look in the comments and there'd be like five new comments or whatever that I've not seen before. Now, obviously they've been like weeks and months old, so I'm not gonna reply to them then. But I see all these things and I'm like, man, I'm not getting notifications. Well, somehow over the last few weeks, it might've been when I upgraded to this new phone. I don't know how technology works. It's not my forte. <clears throat> but somehow I started getting notifications again on YouTube for comments, which is cool. And so lately I've been actually seeing a lot of the comments that have been made on both old and new videos. Um, and I just want to let you know, like I have kind of like a system, right? It's like the DaCosta grading system when it comes to comments. So first of all, if it's a futurist that comments on my videos, I pretty much just discard it as pure stupidity for lack of a better term, right? And I'm, and I hate to say that, um, or maybe I should just say ignorance. I don't know, but I'm, I'm not saying that as <clears throat> harshly as it may sound, but I just have to call it what it is, right? I mean, the, when the futurists come on and comment, and now, you know, Maddie Simon and Joe Dirt Simpson, those types of people, I don't take any of it seriously, right? I, I My typical reaction when I see a futurist comment is I laugh. I literally, LOL. Now, I know people use LOL a lot and they don't mean it, like they're not laughing out loud, but I literally laugh when a futurist comments because it's so convoluted it's so delusional, it's so desperate, it's so stupid, right? It makes no sense, it's so, it's clinging to old things that have nothing to do with them, it's ignoring so many clear time statements, it's ignoring the obvious. And so I lump them in a futurist category and then I then they get a number, the comment and the commenter gets a grade, right? If it's a full preterist who's commenting, same sort of thing happens, I say, okay, well, at least this guy's a full preterist. At least he's exhibiting some signs that he has a little bit of a clue, right? He understands that you can't just ignore all the clear time statements. You have to do something with them, all right? But then based upon what else he or she says, I give them a grade. You know, like if they're on board with IO and they get it and, you know, there's some guys out there that just comment and it's like, oh, you know, it's such a breath of fresh air. They get it. You know what I mean? They have such common sense, logic, honesty, integrity with the scriptures, and they're not gonna just lump themselves in with something just because they're desperate. Those guys get like a nine or a 10. Then there's others who come on and you can see they still get it. They might be struggling with some points. They may not understand certain things. They're still kind of clinging to a few passages, not willing to give it up because they don't want to lose hope for that new Jerusalem, those wings and all that stuff. Those guys get like maybe a six, seven, eight, somewhere in that range. They're coming, they're coming. They're just not quite there yet. They're not ready to give it up yet. Then you get other guys who are just bonker doodle, right? And they just make absolutely no sense. They claim that everything's been fulfilled yet everything's still happening. You know, those types of guys. Those types of guys get one, two, threes, four, somewhere in that range. <clears throat> but then there's guys that are just so ridiculously ignorant and just so far gone from all logic and common sense that they don't even rank on a one to 10 scale. They actually go into the negative. And, and this particular guy that I saw commenting through these screenshots that were sent to me, I remember him back on my YouTube channel like a year and a half ago. And I put up with this cat for a long time. I gave him time and time and time to come around to see how stupid his argument was. He would continuously repeat the exact same argument. <clears throat> his thing was like Acts chapter seven is when it all changed, right? So in other words, the, the mission to the Jews was like, I don't know, a couple years long and then it all changed, right? But he's not looking big picture, obviously. He doesn't know how to put things together. And so he kept repeating the same crap over and over and over again and finally, I just said, you know what? Because I'm compelled to answer people. I don't like letting people think that they have answers, that they've defeated IO. So I like to give them the answers to put them in their proper place. But it just got repetitive and just ridiculously nauseating with this character. And you could tell that he was so unintelligent, 
just the way that he talked, the way that he constantly appealed to Don K. Preston, as if Don K. Preston knew what he was talking about and had valid arguments. <clears throat> he kept repeating it, the same thing over and over again. So finally, I had to block him. I had no choice, right? But it was laughable, okay? But anyways, this guy comes back on and I'm getting the screenshots because I guess he's in one of the IO Facebook groups. And I just recognized the name and I said, oh God, yeah, I remember this guy. Same exact arguments. And now he's saying that no IOer has dealt with Don's fullness of the nations or fullness of the Gentile argument. Which is kind of funny because first of all, I did, okay? Now, I will admit that when Don put that article out, I thought it was only one article, okay? Honestly, the, the, the nuts and bolts of it all, the truth of it all, is that Don's argument to me is so laughable. It's so elementary. It's so illogical that I didn't think that he would, A, put out more articles, or B, I didn't think that it required any more of my attention. <clears throat> And I don't even know if I read the whole first article. I probably didn't because I had already heard his fullness argument. So why am I going to waste time looking at the whole article? I know what he says. I know where he hangs his hat on. And I can blow that point to smithereens. So what's the point of reading his whole bo long, boring, nauseating article? This guy can't even put forth a teaching on the Olivet Discourse in less than 200 segments on YouTube. So why am I going to torture myself like that? Please. I do things neatly, concisely, and quickly here. All right? So I did I did make an audio or two replying to his first article. And I demonstrated very easily how wackadoodle his method of interpretation on Romans 11, fullness of the Gentiles, is. And then I guess a few days later, he came out with a part two and a part three and a part four, maybe even a part five, all based upon that same Romans 11 argument. Now, listen, folks, if you need six full-blown articles to explain Romans chapter 11, then you probably don't understand the passage yourself. You don't. It's super simple, okay? And I've explained it handily here. I've tied it to other places. I've showed how it fits within the trajectory of the story and so on and so forth. So I did not reply to those. Now, this particular character, this clown in this group had said, oh, DaCosta and others don't reply to Don's fullness article because they're scared. <laughs> because they're scared. Okay, folks, let me just tell you what Don's fullness article is in a nutshell. All right, this is what it is. He looks at the word fullness in Romans 11 there, and he, it's pleroma, as you probably know. And the true definition is to be filled to capacity, right? The, the uh, definitions actually use the analogy or the example of, um, a ship being filled to capacity with people. So that's the, the definition of pleroma. Your main definition, right? Filled to capacity. Now, Don comes and he says, well, look, fullness over here, pleroma over here is used to represent, I don't know, like, you know, fullness, like quality or um, status or whatever the case may be, right? Like the fullness of Christ for example, right? So yes, there's a couple examples of that method, just like in English, when we say the word full, right? Like we could say like, I'm full, you're full of crap, right? It doesn't mean you're literally full of crap. It means you're, you're a bullshitter, right? You're lying. You're joking, right? It's a, it's a different way of using a word that could otherwise be used for full to capacity, Right? The word full, if I say the hall is full, that means it's full to capacity. No one else can get in there. Okay? I'm full. My stomach's full. I can't fit anything else in there. This is just common stu sense stuff here. And you know, it's kind of funny because Don makes the argument a lot in his videos, or he used to at least, that when he's arguing these futurist wannabes, he says, if we can prove the word soon is used literally as soon. One time. All we need to do is prove it one time. Then that means, folks, that the word soon in these places 
could certainly mean soon, right? So in other words, what he's doing, he's saying, all you got to do is find one time that that word, that Greek word, whatever it is, actually meant soon and at hand, and it falsifies the futurist claims. Well, the same could be said for Don's Pleroma argument. All you need to do is find one example that the word Pleroma is used to speak of fill to capacity in the, in the New Testament, and it would falsify Don's argument. And folks, you know, from my study, or if you just do a simple word search on the word pleroma and look up its usages in the New Testament, you will see that it is used as filled to capacity or as full or as not going any further. Okay. So Donnie's got no argument, but it gets even better. It gets even worse than that for Donnie in terms of his fullness argument, because Don's fullness argument says that the fullness of the Gentiles speaks of equal status. In other words, Paul in Romans, let's call it 50 AD, just, just for the sake of argument. Paul in Romans is saying, in the future, there's going to come a time when the Gentiles reach equal status as the Jews. Let me repeat that. Paul in AD 50, after the gospel had clearly gone out to many, many nations, it's even you can even make the argument that it had already gone out to all creation and every creature under heaven, as Paul wrote to the Colossians around the same time. In fact, oh yeah, in the book of Romans, I think Paul does say that it had already gone out to all the world, right? So Paul is supposedly here speaking of a future time when the Gentiles were going to reach equal status as the Jews. Because apparently to Don, they hadn't reached that status yet around the time that Paul wrote to the Romans. Now, obviously there's problems, right? Because Don would admit, and he quotes very often other passages like, oh yeah, one chapter prior in Romans 10, where Paul says there is now no distinction between Jew and Greek or Jew and Gentile. Of course, we know that's within the body of Israel as a covenant whole, but Let's forget that for a second and let's look at what Paul says there. And let's look at other places like Galatians 3. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. So wait a minute. On one hand, Paul is saying that there's no distinction, no status distinction, no status difference. You guys are both the same in Christ, right? He's saying that at the same time that he supposedly, according to Don, saying that they had not reached equal status as the Jews yet. So, we got a little bit of an issue here. And what is the issue? Well, the issue is that clearly Paul's whole message during this time frame was that there was absolutely no status distinction whatsoever. They were equal in Christ. They were one in Christ. In fact, earlier on in that same epistle to the Romans, Paul is working and telling them, what advantage do we have? What difference are we? We're all the same. We're all guilty. Of course, he's quoting Old Testament passages about Israel. But his whole point in this whole epistle is to break down that wall and say, hey, you guys are the same. There is no status difference. But Don, realizing the devastating point that Romans 11 is to his theology, has to say that this means that there would be a future time when the Gentiles would reach equal status as the Jews. So essentially what Don is saying is that the Jews were better than the Gentiles at that point. The Jews had something over the Gentiles at that point. We're talking 20 years at least into this so-called mission of these last days. And Paul is still preaching something, saying, hey, the Jews are better, but at some time in the future, you Gentiles are going to reach equal status? <laughs> what? Furthermore, I would really like to see, and perhaps Don explained this in the rest of his boring articles, but Donnie would have to describe and explain to us in what way that status would become equal. In other words, in what way would the Gentiles reach equal status as the Jews? That's what I want to know. Explain that. Describe it in detail. Back it up with scripture. Show us how that's possible. Because remember, folks, 
at this stage of the game, at this point in the mission, the supposed Gentiles, right, had already been given the sign of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so how on earth are these Gentiles any different? And how on earth is there any distinction in status, whatever you want to call it, than the Jews? It just doesn't work. So that absolutely destroys Don's fullness argument. Okay, now, obviously, if you followed me, you know that I use numerous New Testament portions to show that this was an absolute mission for the elect. Okay, now that fact alone, that elect fact is like a slap in the face to Don and his theology and his fullness argument because it shows that there was going to come a time when all the elect were, were sealed, all the elect were in. That's the fullness of the nations. What does Paul say in Romans 4? He says, it is not of uh, the law or it is of grace that it might be through faith so that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not only to the seed of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of our father Abraham. So in other words, not only to the seed of the Jews, but also to the seed in the nations. That's the sheep not of this fold that Jesus spoke of in the beginning. I have sheep here and also of, not of this fold. That's the sun scattered abroad that Caiaphas spoke of in, I think it's Matthew chapter 11. So the point here is very clear. There was a point that was going to come when the promise would be sure to all the seed. Now, Donnie likes to say, well, this is an eternal day. It's an eternal ongoing age. There is no end. There is no end to the gospel mission. But that is a direct violation and clash with the New Testament. Because the New Testament shows there was an end. <laughs> it shows there was an end. 1 Corinthians 15, the order of the resurrection. Christ the first fruits, then those who are Christ's. When? At his coming. Then comes the end. Holy cow. Did you hear that? All those who are Christ, at his coming, then comes the end. That matches John 6. All who you give to me, I will raise on the last day and will not lose one. Don, when was the last day? Revelation 7. Do not harm the earth, the trees, the sea, until we have served all the servants of our God on their forehead. Conclus conclusive statement? Yes, it is. This mission, folks, was to go out and seek the elect. It wasn't a vague mission. It wasn't a anybody, anywhere, Eskimos, Indians, Australians, it, it had nothing to do with them, obviously. Okay, it didn't go to those places. It went to the known world. Don knows this. And it went out for seeking the elect from the four winds. Okay, so it was seeking certain individuals from the four winds. And even Acts 13 says it was only the Gentiles who were appointed to eternal life who believed. <laughs> Doesn't even say that the Gentiles believed unless they were appointed to eternal life. Elect, Donnie. So, folks. The fullness of the nations and just change the word to nations to what it really belongs to. And it tells a whole different story. All right. Fullness of the Gentiles. Change it to fullness of the nations. When the fullness of the nations comes in, in this way, in what way? By way of those in the nations coming in, all Israel would be saved because that was the end goal. And look at what Paul says. He says it, was, it will be at that time when the deliverer comes and takes away sin from the Gentiles. Oh, no, it doesn't say Gentiles. Actually, it says he will come and take away sin from Jacob and establish his new covenant with Jacob, with Israel. Interesting how you have the fullness of the nations there contributing to all Israel being saved. And then the very next thing that Paul declares is that at that time, the sins of Israel will be removed. <clears throat> the new covenant will be established with Israel. I thought we were talking about Gentiles. <laughs> right? So, folks, if you think that Donnie's fullness argument is actually good and actually makes sense, then you have another thing coming. All right? And perhaps if Donnie declines my request here to let me beat up on him for a time, time, and half a time in YouTube on YouTube, then maybe I'll go back and I'll get those articles and I'll look at them more in depth and I will go through every one and make a series out of it. Perhaps that's what I'll do. But to suggest that Don has defeated IO because he produced a handful of cringeworthy, illogical, inconsistent, unnatural, 
articles defining Romans 11 is ludicrous because IO has ripped the Bible to shreds. IO is more Berean than anybody out there. And you have no right to call IO God haters and things of that nature because IO actually studies the same book you do and comes to different conclusions. So if you claim to be a debater, a defender of truth, a defender of the everlasting gospel, then you need to get off your butt and defend it. Because I.O. has not gone away. And it's not going anywhere. There's too much evidence for it. In a court of law, any bit of evidence can create reasonable doubt. This isn't even close. Okay, This is mountains of evidence to suggest that this is the proper viewpoint. So folks, I leave it at that for you. This is where I'm going to cap it for today. The challenge has been issued. We can do it any way Don wants. It's got to be YouTube video exchanges. Okay. I'm not doing any kind of physical debate. I'm not getting into any fist fights with any wannabes. All right. Maybe I'll bring a whole crew of IO guys and we'll come in there. No, I'm just kidding. Be like the old uh, OK Corral. But no, none of that. YouTube exchange debate, very clear. And honestly, if you're going to use the argument that I'm going to be mean or I'm going to be harsh or I'm going to be rude or I'm going to be crude or I'm going to make memes or I'm going to make fun of you, I won't. Okay, you have my word. I will do this as professionally as possible. Now, I can't promise that I won't include a little sarcasm. I have to. When I'm dealing with these types of ludicrous arguments, I have to use a little sarcasm. It's just who I am. It's my nature. It highlights the, 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 the insanity of some of these arguments the inconsistencies of some of your arguments. So I can't promise that I won't use any of that, but I can assure you that I won't make memes. I won't be a jerk. I won't swear. I won't cuss. I'll use nice language, okay? So I'm not giving you any reason why you shouldn't accept this. So Don, 10 videos, each video up to 30 minutes. You can start it out. If you want to start it and just continue to make them, and then I come back and respond to all 10, that's fine too. 30 minutes, perhaps you do 10, 10 reasons or 10, 10 lectures on why IO isn't true. Look, I'm even coming up with the ideas for you. 10 lectures on why IO is not true by Don K. Preston. Lecture number one, 30 minutes, go through some points. Lecture number two, 30 minutes, add to those points, continue to build on those points. <clears throat> continue to tie in the Old Testament, continue to refer to Isaiah 65 and 66, which has nothing to do with you. Please, I beg you, do this. And then I will come back and I will respond to each one in time. And we'll go from there. We'll see what happens. And at the end of it, we'll see who's left standing and who isn't. <clears throat> so the challenge has been issued. Folks, that's where I'm going to leave it today. I hope you all have a great day. If you know Don Preston, if you can see Don Preston, if he hasn't blocked you, if he hasn't kicked you out of a Facebook group, post this link and make sure that he sees it. Okay? Because I can't post on his channel. If I could, I would post it in the comments of his video. I urge you, if you're a listener, if you're a sub, if you're a subscriber and you like Don, you like his content, post my video link in his comments. I won't be able to defend it. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. Who knows? But at least he'll see it. I just want him to see it. Okay? And uh, yeah, the rest of this week, I'm going to probably be MIA. Got a big trip coming up. But I'm putting this out there into the universe and hopefully Donnie takes it and does what he should and saves Christianity from IO. Anyways, folks, have a great day. Have a great week. Maybe you will catch me. Maybe you won't. If I have a little time, perhaps I'll chime in. But other than that, I hope you enjoyed it. Give it a like and we'll catch you on the flip side. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.